Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. I'm the CEO of Rue Global, and we are strategists and market influencers for the community of people with disabilities in the aging market. I'm really proud that today we are offering live captioning, and I want to thank Pumi behind the scenes, and of course, Doug Foresta, my producer behind the scenes as well, uh, for helping us make sure this show is totally accessible. And I'm very excited about our guest today. Uh, Diane Lightfoot, the CEO of Business Disability Forum, is joining us from London, where she says it is boiling hot. <laughs> and uh, But we are just really honored to have Diane on the show today. So Diane, welcome. Hi, thanks, Deborah. Very pleased to be here. It is roasting hot, but you know, we which <laughs> people like to talk about the weather and complain. So ignore me. <laughs> yeah, it's either too hot or too cold, but oh, absolutely. Uh, Uh, We understand we're getting so much rain here in Virginia. So, and today I'm actually joining from Buffalo, New York, because we're uh, coming for a uh, family reunion. So, yes. So Diane, I had the pleasure, I've known about you for a while, but I had the pleasure to meet you in Geneva when we both attended the ILO GBDN, Global Business Disability Network. And I have known about the Business Disability Forum for a long time as well, but I didn't realize um, how much of a global impact Business Disability Forum was having. And so I really want to talk about that more. But before we go there, will you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became the CEO of such an amazing group, Business Disability Forum? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So I have been here in post for nearly 18 months now, and uh, it definitely feels like home, although it felt like home pretty quickly, actually. And before that, I worked for another disability charity called United Response here in the UK, and I was director of policy and communications. And United Response mainly works with adults with learning disabilities and autism and severe and enduring mental health conditions. And while I was there, I kind of got to know the employment services and I was there 13 years. So you know how it is when you've been in a job a long time, you kind of acquire stuff. So I got really interested in the employment services and ended up acquiring them and sort of taking on supported employment under my wings, if you were. And what really struck me so much was how employment and a job, a good job, has the ability to transform lives in a way that I I think almost nothing else that we did as a social care provider organisation did. And I would see people from maybe their 20s, but also 30s, 40s, 50s, who had grown up with the expectation that that work wasn't for them. And, you know, however well-meaning that was framed, that there were no aspirations about a career. um, People were very worried, didn't really see didn't really see the human potential, to use your your expression. Um, And then when they got a job for the first time, just seeing the transformation in people's lives, in their self-esteem, their confidence, their circle of friends, of course, their income. um, And it it was just a fantastic thing to see. And uh, so I got I got really into this and did some speaking at some of our political party conferences, always alongside some of the people that we had supported into work, which was the best thing about it. And um, one of my favorite memories is being at the it was at the Conservative Party conference a couple of years ago. And we had a fringe event on employment for people with learning disabilities. And in the UK, you you probably know that the disability employment gap is is pretty big. Um, Um, So employment overall is about 80%. For disabled people, it's more like 48%. For people with a learning disability, it's less than 6%. So it was about that. And uh, alongside me on the panel, I had a young lady called Aisha, who we'd supported to get a job at the cinema locally in Manchester. And she talked so eloquently about the difference it made to her life and how sometimes now she went out with her boyfriend and she paid and all this kind of stuff and the confidence it was just brilliant and she had the room in the palm of her hands and I thought you know this is what this is what it's about it's about including people it's about seeing what they can do and their strengths and it was just brilliant so I kind of fell in love with employment in that way and then eventually I thought I have been here for 13 years I, I probably should have a little look around 
And I had a look and I saw the job as CEO of Business Disability Forum. And I knew Business Disability Forum a bit, having done an event uh, with, with Susan, our founder, probably about 10 years ago now. So I thought, well, that, that looks really interesting. So um, I found out more and applied. And the more I found out, the more I thought, this is like my dream job. And um, fortunately, the panel seemed to share that opinion. So, uh, <laughs> so sometime later, here I am. But uh, no, it's a, it's a great organization. Yeah, it really is. And and one thing that I really liked about, there's so much I like about this, the Business Disability Forum, but one thing um, that I really like is that your corporate members really, really come together to come up with solutions that not only work for them, but really can work for other corporate brands. And you're working with very, very large corporate brands too. I know some of your members, uh, of course, Atos and Barclays, a couple of amazing corporations, mm -hmm. And but there's so many more. But the content that you're providing to your members is very rich. And I, 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 and I, and I say that in that I see so many groups that are still at the introductory levels. And that, by the way, the, the reality is there's still so much work that needs to be done and in really truly including people with disabilities in the workforce and retaining them. Yep. But I see mainly around the world, Disability 101. Let's tell you why you should, you should hire people with disabilities as opposed to the real deep deep dives. And it's like, all right, but how do I make sure my HR process is fully accessible and inclusive? And how do I accommodate or provide adaptions as they're called in the UK for people with disabilities? I mean, there's, it's, it's a really, there's a lot of moving parts. And, and I think sometimes the moving parts actually intimidate the corporations. And so I, I think that the work that you are doing and the leadership and the mentoring as well of mentoring other national networks and other governments, because I know that uh, one of your very talented consultants uh, that works with you, Brendan uh, Roach, is in the, U in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia doing a lot of work. Yep. And, uh, and I know that's just, I just think he's amazing, but you have such an amazing team. Um, but it, it, this is not just happening in the UK. This is happening globally. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about how in the world do you get sure. corporations to really chip in and make a difference, not only for themselves, but for other corporations as well? Sure. Well, I've, I've been really struck by the fact that our members and partners, and we have about 300 of them, and as you say, they are mainly sort of big name private sector organizations that we also have government departments, NGOs, etc. Um, they really get it. So they're not they're not doing it because they think they have to. They're doing it because they really fully believe that it's not just the right thing to do morally and ethically, which of course it is, but also it's good for their business and it's good for their bottom line and they need a diverse workforce. So we had um, our annual conference back in April and it was called Disability in the Modern Workplace. And we ended the day with a panel called um, The Future of Work. And we had panelists from HSBC, Barclays, um, Microsoft, uh, who else, EY. And they were all saying, if we want to be innovative, if we want to keep on the cutting edge, we need a diverse workforce. It's not, we're not gonna get that. We're not gonna get, become disruptors in the market if we just hire the same people who all you know think the same way we need that creative difference so that was that was just such a strong message right across the piece and the other thing i really like and have been so impressed by is how our members really collaborate and i think i think part of that goes back to um what we were talking to, to neil about the other week neil atos around giving employers and businesses a safe space so they can talk honestly and openly about the challenges and in a lot of places people it, it can be really intimidating hearing a load of people talk about however they've got everything nailed and everything's perfect because let's face it nobody ever has and nobody ever can and even if you, you think you have you probably haven't and there's always more to do so that safe space where people can share ideas and talk about what works and what doesn't I think is is really fundamental to our ethos and the other thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is we don't we don't tell people off, we try and encourage them. And going back to your bit about entry level or more sophisticated, some of our members massively sophisticated, doing tons of, tons of stuff. So for them, we're aiming to, to involve them in our policy and looking at how we can just kind of push a bit and do a bit of interesting new stuff. And I, I can talk about our latest kind of campaign theme a bit later, if you like. 
but some people are in early stages and even if they if they get it sometimes practical implementation is really 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 hard so to use the example of again thinking of a cinema i seem to be in a, a cinematic mood today um we had a member call our advice line to say they need to have a difficult conversation with an em employee and the best practice advice was well you need to find um, a quiet room that you can talk to them but of course they're a cinema they don't have a quiet room so then we go okay what's the nearest equivalent mm -hmm. how can we make this work practically for you in the situation that you're in so it's it's that whole whole range of stuff and then i guess i mean we're, we're uk based but we did a survey last year and between about a third and half of our members are not just uk based whether they are are truly global like the likes of HSBC or whether they are pan Europe or whether they work in a few different overseas markets and they were increasingly saying look you've, you've got these tools what about doing something that could work for us in the different countries where we work because we're really struggling to find an equivalent so earlier this year we set up our global task force with some of those great members that, that you mentioned um, notably Shell who um, co-chaired it with them and they are obviously a huge global brand to take our disability standard which is a whole organizational framework for change and say okay what, what can we do to make that work for DNI leads so that it works right across the piece whatever country that they, they are operating in how can they make sure that they are making a difference and I'm very pleased to say that we launched that new tool on Monday this, this very week at the DFID summit so that's great progress. Yeah it, it is it's very exciting progress and the leaders that um, are actually coming from these efforts and I'll pick on uh, Neil Milliken um, uh, my uh, co-host on Access Chat but also the accessibility lead for ATOS um, which is a global brand, and they just acquired another company in the United States, which means they have 23,000 employees in the United States, which is very exciting. And um, But I remember when he first joined the group, and uh, he was really learning this himself. Uh, he already was an expert, but what he did to really... Um, to, to really build out the programs for ATOS, but also to really add value to this business disability forum, made him more of a global leader for everyone, which is very exciting. And yes. I just see so much leadership coming from your organization and from your members. And uh, I also, when you and I were in Geneva and we were at the second day event, for the national disability networks. Mm -hmm. If you are a national disability network like Business Disability Forum, um, you can join the ILO Global Business Disability Network for free because they want to encourage the local, the national, and the global conversations. But think about the example, once again, that Diane just gave with Shell. Shell is a huge multinational corporation that's, I believe, in most countries, I, I know they're very, very big in the United States, and um, I see them when I travel, but getting these corporations to really be in there and to be committed to the inclusion of people with disabilities and accessibility and all the moving parts, but at the same time, be global leaders and helping other brands, I, I just think it is really important, but I love the leadership that you and your team were showing to the other national networks, some of that we had national networks. For, there were so many, Mexico, Canada, Australia, Sri Lanka, uh, China. There, there were just, I believe there's like 26. Of course, there's over 200 countries, so we still need more, but t helping them be more successful. Um, I know that you've been working with, we mentioned this already, but you've been working with the uh, national network in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to really help make sure they have substance. And I think that is very interesting because we know that you're having success in the UK and Europe, but tell us more about how you're helping the rest of the world. Well, the, the Saudi piece is interesting. We've been working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for quite some time. And you're right that um, Brendan Roach, who is amazing, so shout out to Brendan, um, is, is leading that. And um, we helped to set up a network there called Kadaroon. And you will have met um, Aya from Kadaroon, yes. who is, who is yes. amazing, um, she is amazing. At, at that meeting in Geneva. And they're doing some brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, so, I mean, that's a fantastic story. Going back 
further um, the Australian network they obviously they, they've been very closely involved with us they use a version of our disability standards so we, we're really happy to sort of share stuff and promote best practice because you said you know 200 countries and 26 networks there's so much to do we don't want to be reinventing wheels we want to be right. pushing it out and sharing it and um to that end, I was lucky enough to meet with the lovely Stefan Trommel on, uh, what day is it? Wednesday this week uh, for, for breakfast, also with Brendan, to talk about a closer collaboration between uh, Business Disability Forum and the ILO, which is something we've been gradually building up and talking to him about since we met last October. And so we're looking at how we do that this year and hopefully we'll have something to say at a conference in October where he's asked us to present on the new maturity model, new global tool. So, you know, so we can encourage people to sign their charter and, and generally just try and join this stuff up because that's that's the important thing. Incidentally, he told me that um, I think it's next week or the week after he's going to launch a new network in China right. and also one in India is also um, coming along hot on its heels. So right. there is some real movement there, which is fantastic. Well, it is fantastic because what I often see when I'm traveling to the different countries and, uh, you know, hearing about progress or lack of progress of including people with disabilities is that the there's a lot of activities in certain parts of the world. We see activities in the U.S., we see activities in Australia, in the U.K., in Europe, parts of Europe, and but these these are multinational corporations that have, you know, employees all over the world. And if you, I have to wonder if you can employ people with disabilities in the United Kingdom or in the United States, but you have branches in India or Africa or Singapore or wherever, and you're not also including people with disabilities in those countries. Um, I think there's there's some failure, some part, and some there, something's wrong. And I think that these multinational corporations really need support so that they can be successful in all the countries. But another thing, once again, I compliment your leadership on this, but we have to build the national networks from those countries. And so I think the, um, the example of the work that you're doing in the kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and that y'all were doing it in Australia before in other countries, this is how we're successful is when you build the infrastructure mm -hmm. and the talent right in those countries and you don't make them reinvent the will. Why do we need to reinvent the will? We are better together. Definitely. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, and and I'm I wanted to have you on the program first, just because you're the CEO, and I wanted you to really talk more about what business di disability forum is doing. But I really am hoping that Brendan it will come on oh, he with. Wants to. I wanted to, I really wanted to come on and talk about what's happening in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I had the pleasure to go over there and interview uh, a Tatweer who's doing some work over there, but it's very exciting what's happening. And I think that we, you know, we need to make sure that the world knows that collaboration is happening with all countries, even the US, we're collaborating to make the world a better place for yeah. all of us. Uh, even in sometimes these odd political times for the US, we're still, there's still progress being made. Yeah. And so let's, let's stick a little bit more into Business Disability Forum because it, it's, I think, because um, maybe some of my viewers don't really understand what you're offering. They might think that you're just like a lot of the other organizations out there that are doing business, uh, you know, Disability 101, which there's nothing wrong with that, except as you said, these corporations, some of them are getting more and more, um, you know, they're smarter and they're being very progressive. And it is not just a one size fits all. It cannot be just Disability 101. I, I had somebody the other day that's going to move into the marketplace after retiring, they said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start offering disability etiquette to all the corporations in the U.S. or offering, you know, offering to do that. And do you think that's good, Deborah? And I said, I think we're getting beyond that. I mean, there's still a need for some of that, but we need richer, more robust programs. And that's something that you're offering. So 
do you mind talking a little bit more about the rich? I, I just think your programs are so rich. Thank so. you. Well, um, well, it's 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 good timing because yesterday uh, evening we had our partner reception event, uh, which was which is fab, which RBS hosted, and we had this indoor garden, and it was a it was it was it was amazing. It was a very cool event. But um, we used it to launch a new sort of campaign theme, small C campaign around identity. So whilst it's really important that we do the stuff for people who are starting out, we wanted something that really kind of explored it's more interesting issues in more depth, if, if you like. So we had a theme last year around non-visible disabilities. And as part of that, we started to talk about identity and we started to talk about the kind of pros and the cons, if you like, of having a visible versus a non-visible disability. And on the one hand, if you have a non-visible disability, you've got the luxury of choice, if you like, as to whether you tell people. But however, um, the, the opposite side of that coin is if you do need support or you do need adjustments, you have to keep effectively coming out over and over and over again. And we were talking about the fact that people will, will then um, worse face potentially abuse if they don't look disabled but need to use um, a blue badge parking or need to use an accessible toilet. So all these sorts of things. So we were starting to talk about that and about how identity fits in. And then the second one was around sort of data and to use a technical term, though I don't like it, disclosure. And a lot of our members and partners are really keen to get their employees to tell, to tell them to disclose if they have a disability. But we're saying, you know, how, how can you get people to tell you if perhaps they don't really see themselves as disabled, if they don't identify as a person with a disability, or, or perhaps they do sometimes, whether depending on if they have a fluctuating condition or a progressive condition, or if it's in context with other disabled people or not. So we started to talk about that. And then a kind of final layer on top of that is that the government here in the UK is starting to talk about whether we should have some kind of voluntary reporting scheme for companies in the same way that we do around the gender pay gap, having something around the disability employment gap and the disability pay gap. And of course, that's, that's generally kind of a good thing to know where we are, but it's very, very complex because if people aren't saying that they have a disability, how do you make sure that the data is actually meaningful and robust and also how do you make sure that um, people don't just kind of change categorization, if you see what I mean? And then we say, oh, brilliant, we've got a million more people into jobs, but actually it's just people in jobs sort of feeling, OK, now I feel safe to say. So we need to get that right now. So so that's why we kind of launched this theme around identity. And we had four different speakers, um, all with different disabilities or um long-term conditions talking to us very candidly really kind of whole person stuff about how they saw themselves how it progressed through their lives um and we've also got a theme of uh, identity on our new podcast series so our first one out yesterday which is uh, me talking to um lucy our technology task force manager and we're kind of swapping stories um sort of i don't want to do too much of a spoiler but but hers about um lose, losing her leg in an accident in her teens and mine about my experiences of depression and mental health and you know what that's about and um as i kind of said in the podcast is it right to promote another podcast from a podcast i don't know um, it is yeah, okay it's fine so, so i don't <laughs> see it as a disability but i have started talking about my experiences of mental health because i've had feedback that that helps other people to feel able to do that so that's what that's why I, i've started doing it anyway so so that's what we launched last night and we had really good feedback of people saying this is really interesting it's really complex and it's really about the whole people so we'll see how that how that develops but we'll be continuing that theme for you know for the year and through our events yes and i also have talked um openly on access chat uh, my other show that you were also on uh last uh, last week and um and, and we'll make sure that we put the links to the podcast that she's referring to that they did last night with her and lucy and we also will put out the link to um uh, the show that she did with Access Chat, because we were talking about this from, because it's such a broad topic also Huge. from a, yeah, yeah, we were talking about from different pieces, but I also am, um, you know, a human being that has, a, you know, experienced uh, mental health issues, uh, depression and anxiety and ADHD with the H being I'm 
so I'm really productive, probably too productive. I try to do too much, but it's hard for me to step it down and relax. Mm. And so I, um, I remember I've talked about it, you know, um, as I hope when it's relevant and I've had people come back and say, Oh, I, I would never think Deborah that you, you seem so positive. I would never think that you struggle with the depressions and, and you know, and I think it is important to, to talk about it because the reality is we are these beautiful, complex human beings. And some of us have very visible disabilities. Some of us have, you know, disabilities are not as visible, but maybe people think, you know, um, you know, they decide something about us um, because they don't even realize that we have a, an invisible disability. But it's it's um, it's an interesting um, it's a very interesting broad topic when you talk about disclosure or self identification because here in the United States we um, are really really encouraging people with disabilities to self identify. But the reality is that here that we know that people with disabilities are often discriminated against and there's, I can pretend that there's no risk for you to disclose or identify, especially if you already have a job, right? I can say, mm -hmm. do it, do it, you know, come on. But the reality is, that, of course, these are people's lives and everybody needs to do what they feel comfortable with doing. And when we created in the United States, not a quota but we created goals for all of our federal contractors, which is a substantial amount of corporations in the US that uh, they have a 7% goal. And by the way, we want you to tell us in writing, and it's going to go to our Congress and Senate, that, uh, you know, how are you doing on that? How are you doing um, recruiting? And um, I mean, it looks at it from the minute... Uh, hopefully a candidate with a disability applies to you mm -hmm. all the way through. And so it, and it includes retention and um, it, it, you know, things are very, a, a little um, interesting right now in the United States under our current political situation. Um, and if programs are being cut and we're losing fundings, we just celebrated uh, our 28th year celebration of the Americans with Disabilities Act yesterday, which is yay. Um, but at the same time, the United States has not ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons mm -hmm. with Disabilities. So as uh, people with disabilities, Americans with disabilities leave our borders, you know, they um, don't have the same protections of the ADA because the ADA is in the United States. So there, like you said, there's so many moving parts and it's a very, it's very complicated, but I just, as some of, some of the tools that business disability forum has come up with the training, the, the, it's very, it's, it's very robust content. And I personally would like to see that content made available in the United States selfishly, sorry, but <laughs> I, I just, yeah. in the United States, so many corporations are being sued because they're not including people with disabilities or their websites are not accessible. And these corporations need solutions, which is another reason why I wanted to have you on the show, mm. because I, you know, of course, this is not just about one country over another country, but this is about the multinational corporations that, you know, have millions and millions and millions of jobs. And how do we support each other, which is why I know you bo both of us really believe in the work the ILO GBDN is doing. And yeah. I'm really excited about the Chinese, the, the China network. And then the, I, um, and then in India, they're having uh, their first network meeting in September. So there's actually progress being made. There, but, no, there is. There is. Yes. Yes. So tell us more about some some of the other programs we can, and and all you know um, and also how in the world, Diane, do you get these these member corporations to really pitch in and really give their intellectual you know knowledge and to work with each other? Because I don't see this always happening in a lot of these organizations. I see mainly the organizations, the staff of the organizations are doing everything, but their members pretty much, you know, they might sponsor some events or attend your conference, mm -hmm. but I don't see the rich dialogues happening, which result in programs that could actually be adopted by corporations to include people with disabilities in the workforce. So, um, yeah. but I do see it with you. 
Thank you. Uh, I guess on the collaboration thing, I think probably the best example of that is our technology task force, which of course Neil Millican sits on. Neil is fantastic. Um, and that's been going 10 years and obviously predates me. But having been to a lot of the meetings and engaged with those people, they're, the, they're firstly, they're the right people in the room. They're people who really believe and really engage and, and have a position within their organisations that they can influence and affect change. Um, but I think what's been really crucial in getting them to really collaborate is because they have driven the direction of the task force. So I, I spoke about Lucy earlier and she's the manager, but in a way she's almost more a facilitator because right. the group self-determine their priorities. They volunteer to lead different task streams of work. They take on and volunteer to be accountable for those and they feed back on it. And so, so they go away and okay, they have the meetings, but they also go away and they self-organize with, with quite a lot of facilitation behind the scenes as well from Lucy to create something that really makes a difference and I, th I think that model well that was a model we tried to recreate and we I think we have um, with the global task force people really working together and sharing expertise and I think I think these organizations as well really recognize that if we're going to crack it it's bigger than any one corporation right. it's you know it, it's got to be done collaboratively and that then raises the bar for everybody and I think going back to the sort of the global piece um as well as the ILO that's one of the reasons why I'm so keen and so happy to be supporting Caroline Casey and her valuable campaign because a lot of the time businesses kind of get left out of the picture or brought in too late and the fact that she's getting on the likes of Paul Poman the CEO of Unilever to stand up on a stage at the Difford event this week actually and talk about that's his priority and engage at that level and she wants to get I think four other equivalents of him and 500 global businesses and given that she is such a dynamo I kind of think if anyone can do it Caroline can do it and if we can then support her with the practical delivery behind that then that's that's fantastic and I should actually say um that, that I was really quite heartened by the Diffid Summit that was this week. So we did this private sector event on the Monday night where we launched our new tool. That was great. And that was very practical and it was aimed at business. The main summit the next day was aimed at developing countries and um, lots of different African countries were talking and giving different pledges and commitments and talking about their networks. And there was a guy there from an Egyptian disability network, for example, that I saw sharing practice and talking about it. And um, I, I thought slightly cynically, I thought, I wonder if this will lead to change, you know? And then the next day I went to an event at the British Council and I met two brilliant young men from Ghana who had recently set up a tech company to help disabled people. One of the two, they're brothers, one of the two was blind. And they said that going to that summit and hearing what other people had done had just completely changed their perception and made them so fired up about what could be done. And they were saying, this, we're such a long way behind this. So there's so much to do, but now we at least we, we've got ideas. We know what we can do. And I thought, if only they come away with that, then it's achieved something. So right, right. that was really good to hear. I, I agree. And I, um, I thought it was actually um, brave of the UK government to do this big disability summit forum mm -hmm. because, um, you know, of course, they've been very, very openly criticized uh, with the way they're, you know, handling uh, disability issues, uh, not uh, pretty much any government you can insert right in there and say that about. Um, there's just yeah. so much work to be done, but it's got to be done. Um, I mean, there, of course, we know the saying nothing about us without us. So yep. if we are just talking about people with disabilities, but not really including the people that are part of the country, the people with disabilities, teaching them to lead, I mean, we're not going to be successful. And of course, this all ties in to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as well. Yep. That no one left so, behind. Yeah, no one left behind. And and when you look at the 17 goals, many of them, you know, talk, you know, it would be about including people with disabilities. I mean, they, yeah. they're very broad goals, important goals, you know, ending, you know, poverty, uh, hunger, uh, you know, all, all the things that we should be doing, having clean, healthy oceans, all of these things can and should be about including people with disabilities because there's a billion yep. people in the world with disabilities and there are, and those numbers are growing. So I, I think 
working together collaboratively is the only way to do it. And I'm always discouraged when um, some organizations, NGOs and nonprofits just think, um, I'm going to own this whole world and nobody else can be included and we're not going to collaborate only because that sort of has gotten the world to where we are. And so I love the, you know, your team and how collaborative you are and that you're working with brilliant groups like the Purple Space with Kate mm -hmm. Nash and oh, she's brilliant. And Purple Space Carol is great. Yeah. Oh, they're wonderful. And yeah. Caroline, I just agreed to be an ambassador with Purple Space because I love the work. And I have a daughter and a husband with a disability. And I actually have a disability under our Americans with Disabilities Act because mental health and depression falls into it. But it's not really about even that. It's about really focusing on what we each bring to the table and not deciding, well, you can't participate, Diane, because which shall I pick for the reason why I'm going to leave you out? I mean, it's just ridiculous. And so I, I just think we need to have more collaborations in the world and, and maybe not worry in so much about who's going to get credit, but actually how do we all make sure that people with disabilities are more meaningfully included? And it's just very interesting to watch and um, watching from afar of the work that y'all have been doing for so long, it, it's, it, it gives me great hope. And so um, I, I know that I've taken, you know, we've gone for 30 minutes, but I want to make sure, Diane, that people know how to get hold uh, of you and they know how to um, find business disability form. Now, once again, we're going to put out um, on, the, I'm going to put out some links to the podcast that we mentioned and the appearances that Diane's been on, but Diane, tell the audience how they can find out more about dis business disability forum and um, maybe support what you're doing. And I hope any corporation that is listening will understand this is a resource that you can go to. You do not have to be located in the United Kingdom. They're there for you so they can be available. So yes, Diane, completely. tell them how to find you. Completely, love to. So our website is businessdisabilityforum.org.uk. Uh, we're on Twitter and our handle is at Disability Smart. My personal one is at Diane Lightfoot. I'm also on LinkedIn and Business Disability Forum is on LinkedIn. So there's loads of ways that you can find us. And yeah, we've, we've got tons of resources. I mentioned the Technology Task Force. That alone has got tons of stuff on our website that anyone can download and use. So yeah, go go and have go and have a play. Go and have a look at what we've got, and then get in contact. Yes, and and join their forces. Join yes, them, please. Um, to you know, uh, you can also find them on the uh, businessanddisability.org, which is the website for the ILO GBDN because yep. they're one of the partners. So um, it, it's it, they're easy to find, and you can always come to me, and I'll introduce you as well. But Diane, applause you. to you and your team. Uh, I, it's, it's very impressive what you're doing and I'm just really excited to, um, I'm really excited to continue these conversations and watch the progress that you're making. So thank you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. You're amazing, Deborah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.